I, you know, I, I've seen preachers through the years, like Jack Hiles or stuff, and they'd take the first 15 minutes and tell jokes, you know, get everybody comfortable. Uh, well, I'm a nobody who believes in somebody. Amen. Okay, that's it. So, okay, First Timothy chapter 2. Amen. I think, uh, you know, I'm two nights, you know, maybe the title, if you too many of you heard it, will switch to something else, but I think you might have mental problems if you listen to me too much, but <laughs> I knew a guy that was such a southern boy, he didn't want to come up north, he didn't want to come north in a Mason-Dixon line, and he told me that he, he uh, gets on goodpreaching.com, and he hits it where it repeats, and he said, goes all night long while he's, pre while he's sleeping. I'm preaching all night long, and I told him, I said, you got problems. <laughs> you got problems. <laughs> and, you know, the thing is, I don't do any of that. That good preaching, I don't put that on there. I don't know who does it, but somebody puts it on there. Uh, I do the sermon audio, and I do some YouTube clips, but that's the only ones that I do. But First Timothy chapter 2. Um, this letter, Paul to Timothy, he was his preacher boy. It's a blessing, it's a blessing, it's a great blessing. When, uh, preachers come out of your church, like Amen. Neil, and uh, we got Joe Kenning and Brett Bishop, and Amen. my son's in Costa Rica, and we got a young lady in um, Germany. And then we got uh, some that we've kind of done it through, the, through uh, the phone conversation. I have a cousin in Kentucky that works on the guys there and a uh, fellow down in Mississippi named Jeremy Wilson. These are somebody that uh, God's allowed me to influence, and it's a blessing. But one of the most disheartening or sometimes discouraging, but probably more disheartening is uh, in a ministry you see so many fall by the wayside. Right. You see so many deceived. Right. Now, I realize that most people are deceived because they want to be. Right. Okay, but I want to give you a formula that we can take care of that. Okay, and now I'm not talking about car sales. If you get hoodwinked in a car, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> but when it gets to Bible, when it gets to Bible, you can sit down with anybody anytime and you could see if they're either trying to deceive you or they've been deceived. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, you'll see it's Adam and Eve. Okay, well, Eve got deceived. Did she not? Yes. Okay, in chapter 4... The entire chapter is about somebody who is being seduced. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The entire chapter is about that. How can we prevent that? Drop down to verse 16. Take heed unto yes. thyself Amen. and unto thy fundamentals of the faith, unto the doctrine. Amen. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save themselves that hear thee. Them that hear thee. Save ourselves from what? Right. Verse 1, deception. Right. Chapter 6, verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of yes. science, falsely so-called which some professing have erred concerning the faith. The word science is found two times in the Bible. It's only found in the King James Bible. Nobody hears that word anymore. It's so archaic. <laughs> Experiments only found in the King James Bible. It's so archaic. Nobody uses that word anymore. Okay, and there's valid science. It's found twice in the Bible. The valid science is with Daniel. He understood science, and this is something called science that's not science. Okay, so if we would, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I pray you'd help us to understand this. Spirit of God, please cleanse us, and I pray that you'd have liberty, that this would be something that a person can take home and, and the rest of their life. Amen. Be comfortable and trust in this book, amen. no matter who talks to them. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so that idea of science, there are, there are four things being pushed on the world in these days. Two began in the 1800s and two of the last decade that claim science, but it's false science. One is evolution. Amen. That's a false science because nobody saw the Maximus Bangus. Right. 
Okay, and the other is in the church, textual criticism. They claim it's a science where they're studying the manuscripts to see which is closest to the originals without seeing the originals. Right. Science has to be something you observe. Right. Right. So that's out. The next thing is the transgender movement. Right. They're trying to claim science, but science says there's only two hey. genders. Right. Okay, and then the last one is the climate change movement. Yeah. That one's designed to bring in world government to save the planet. Right. The transgenders will have no conscience, so they'll kill anybody that goes against them. Mm. Bill Nye says you deserve to die. You don't believe in climate change. Wow. They'll get the churches involved through textual criticism. Yeah. Yeah, amen. Man, I think the yeah. trumpet's getting ready to yeah, sound. Amen, yeah. <laughs> so this idea of deception, okay, um, there are two lines of defense that we have. Like in football, you got the front line. Folks getting ready to wash the toilet bowl tonight. And so you got the front line, you got the middle linebackers, and you got the safety. They got three lines of defense. So I'm going to give you two lines of defense. That's all that's needed. And remember one of the characteristics of the end times when the apostles asked Jesus about the signs of thy coming, he said, be not deceived. It is easier to deceive people than to convince them yes, they have sir. been deceived. Yes, sir. Very easy to do yeah, in this yeah. age. Okay, and the thing is, is truth is often stranger than fiction. So people are shocked. Now, realize what is the purpose of heresy? Why does God allow heresy? Why does God allow the contemporary churches to be packed out? Why does he allow all this stuff? He allows it to prove our sincerity. Are you willing to weed things out and find the truth in that midst of that weeds? Anybody raised in a farm knows a velvet leaf is different than a soybean. Now, most people, oh, that's a clean field. No, no, I see the button weeds along there. Yeah. It's the counterfeit. Right. Okay, so there are very, some deceptions are very easy to spot. You, sometimes you can tell by the fluctuation of a person's voice. If you hear them say, the Holy Ghost, <laughs> one word. You got the Holy Ghost? That's one word. Or if they say the King James Version of the Bible, <laughs> they're somewhere in there. Okay, or have you get baptized? <laughs> Sometimes you can tell by the words. Okay, the fluctuation of the voice. Sometimes you can tell other things. Now, there are some deceptions that are very subtle, okay? When I was in uh, seventh grade, big whopping four foot nine inches tall, driving tractors everywhere, okay? There were twins in my junior high class. They were identical twins. Nobody could tell them apart. And I, I thought to myself, I bet you they get tired of people saying, are you Tim, are you Tom, are you Tom, are you Tim? So I studied them. And I could tell them apart anytime. Not by the clothes, I could tell them from behind. Hey, Tim, how you doing? Hey, Tom, how you doing? That was a very subtle thing. And when I got in college, there was uh, twins again that I befriended. One was Tim, one was Andy. And nobody could tell them apart, but I studied them because I thought they would like to have their own personality. Sure, you can enjoy the idea of being an identical twin, but you are an individual all yourself. And so I studied them, and I could spot them. In fact, I got them, we had an intramural basketball program, and so I got them both on my team. I thought that would confuse the other team, okay, even though they had different numbers. But the idea is that you got to be diligent in some ideas that are so close, and you look for the key words, and you look for very subtle things. The best drivers on the highway are defensive drivers. They don't trust anybody. So the best Bible students are defensive Bible students, okay? And the idea is a lot of times people, I remember Jack Hiles said this in Hiles Anderson, you should not read any heretical material. I thought, if I don't read it, how can I know? <laughs> Who's going to put the Catholic symbol on there? Neo obstant. <laughs> yeah. This is approved. <laughs> and I've learned that a person who will not consider an opposing viewpoint is not confident in his own right. Amen. and so we ought to be able to relax Amen. because Amen. this book is true Amen. so I want to give you two lines of defense okay now the devil is mentioned throughout the Bible on numerous occasions you have Apollyon Lucifer Leviathan you know the devil 
But there are only two times where he is in action, where you have a play-by-play -play account of him in action. One is at the beginning of the Old Testament. One is at the beginning of the New Testament. One is he's trying to deceive the first Adam. The second, he's trying to deceive the second Adam. We have them both at both Testaments. Now, in the first one is the basic program of how he deceived Eve. Okay, and if we go back to that one in Genesis chapter 3, this is the first line of defense. And it's very easy. Uh, it's right in front of us. In Genesis chapter 3 is the occurrence of the deception. Now, we know Adam wasn't deceived, but Eve was deceived. How did this happen? Okay, if we, if we compare chapter 3, verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. So he's the first person to question the Bible. Okay, so he, yea, hath God said. Now, what did God say? Chapter 2, verse 16. Okay, chapter 2, verse 16. It's not hard. Now, he did say this to Adam. He said this to Adam. So maybe he didn't give the message properly to Eve. Maybe she wasn't paying attention. But here's what he said to Adam. The Lord God said, commanded the man, saying. Okay, so here is the Bible for Adam and Eve. They can memorize it pretty quick. Yeah. Honey, did you read your Bible this morning? Yeah, yeah, I did. It took about a minute and a half. <laughs> uh, let's have devotions and read it. What does this mean? Uh, see that tree over there? Don't eat it. <laughs> what do you get out of that? Uh, don't eat that from that tree over there. Okay, so here it is. Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So the next morning, Adam and Eve sit down, they have their apple, they have their fruit, because that's all they ate at that time. And she says, let's get out the Bible and read. And so he got a three by five card out, you know, and read it. And then the next day when they have their meal again, did you get that yesterday, dear? Okay, let's try it again. So when that shows up in chapter three, if we compare back and forth, we can see there are three there are three uh, ideas here that cause or allow deception. Okay, so in chapter 3, verse 2, The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree, uh, trees of the garden. You go back to read in chapter 2, verse 6, what did she leave out? She dropped the word freely. It's only one word. Yeah, thou shalt commit adultery. Bill Clinton only dropped one word. <laughs> it's like the guy is in a courthouse and said, the Bible says, let him that stole steal. So I did that, judge. <laughs> Keep reading, son. <laughs> okay, so she removed one word freely, and that word shows up at the end of the Bible. That's a big deal. Amen. So the first thing is a person subtracts a word or words of the Bible. Okay, the next thing she does, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it. Neither shall ye touch it. Did you read that in chapter 2, verse 17? I didn't read that. So she added a word or words. And then she said, Lest ye die. She changed a word or word. There, that's, it's that simple. Right. Nothing difficult about that. When I'm talking, deal with a water dog, he goes to John 3 and he said, Look here, you know, you got to be born of the water and of the spirit. That's baptism. No, no, you added a word. You added it. Right. Why did you add that? Right. Okay, and you go to the Catholic and he's going to add purgatory. Right. There's, the illustrations are endless right. of what churches do. Okay? Uh, you can run all the water dog ver They're going to add water in one case. They're going to add baptism in another case. Or they're going to have to remove this in this case. It's only, it's very subtle. It's very simple. You add a word, subtract a word, change a word of the Bible, and there's the first line of defense. Amen. So when I'm talking to somebody, and I see they added a word, I, say, I may have misunderstood. I, I don't see that word there. You know, I was talking to J.W., and they were telling about the parable of the rich man Lazarus. So I said, 
you know, I don't remember reading that word parable. I'll give you $20 to see. See, let me see that word. Hey, now I'm Dutch. If you ain't Dutch, okay. Um, you know, we have a saying, if you ain't Dutch, ain't much. But my Polish friend says if you are Dutch, you won't amount to much. So it depends who you talk to. <laughs> now, when I offer a guy $20, I know it's safe. He couldn't find purgatory, and he couldn't find parable in, in the passage. I know I read it. I said, you just keep looking. And I let him think about that. Two years later, I had to deal with the same guy and somebody else was looking out the door. I said, hey, do you ever find that word parable in, in Luke? Uh, he kept walking. <laughs> what did he do? He had to add it. Okay, the Catholics have to add purgatory. Or they have to change some words. There's the first line of defense. You see, it's dishonest to be liberal with the definition of a term. Yes. That's dishonest. Right. What, what gives me the right to stretch the term? Yeah, amen. It means what it says and says what it means. Amen. Okay, and now an author, a rule of thumb is an author can quote or misquote his own writings as he chooses because he knows the intent of the writing. But when you quote someone else, you must keep it within context to be honest. Amen. You don't have to stretch anything to prove this book. Amen. A text without a context is a pretext. Yes. And so we don't need to do that, you know, to prove this is right or so forth. Now, okay, so there's our first line of defense. Don't add, subtract, or change a word or words of the Bible, meaning the Bible of your time. Okay, for Adam and Eve, it was one sentence. Okay, with, with uh, Abraham, it was a dream or vision that they had. Then God placed a conscience in every person because that, that is a thin thread between your spiritual body and your physical body. Where the physical body runs by the DNA, and anybody that studies DNA knows that an intelligent being did that. There's no happenstance on that. And the same goes with our conscience. Okay, where God placed a conscience in you and I. I'm not a dog. I'm not a cat. I got a conscience. Okay, my dog, if he bites somebody, he better not. But if he does... He's not going to lay his head down and, oh, I can't believe I bit that guy. I feel bad about that. Right. They don't get a conscience. Right. You know, they don't have, uh, you know, theft. they don't have a justice for theft, for murder, for adultery. They don't do that in the jungle. They don't have a conscience. Right. Okay, we have a conscience. So the first line of defense. Now, in this age, the Bible is the final authority for all matters of faith and practice. For Jesus' time period, it would be our Old Testament. Okay, he defined it in Luke chapter 24. In this time period, I've got it right in front of me. Amen. Now, if, if uh, you weren't Bible believers, I'd have to take some time and run down that path for a little while and get that fixed. But we're settled on that. At least I am, and I'm Amen. sure you are. <laughs> and I can run the seven statements and all that stuff. There we go. That's the sermon my wife preached. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Okay, so there's, there's line of defense number one. Now, number two gets a little more complex. Let's try Luke chapter 4. I say it's a little more complex, but uh, the, tr the simplicity is truth's most becoming garb. Yes. Okay, now this second occurrence of the devil in action is a play-by-play -play account Okay, and that first one, that first one is how, that's his first choice of running through there. And the second one is the smoothest, slickest way to deceive. And we'll see it in Luke chapter 4. Matthew 4 is another place, but I'm going to try, I'm going to go with the Luke chapter 4. As, as you run down through it, you'll see in verse 1, the Spirit of God led uh, the Lord Jesus into the wilderness Okay, and then the temptation in verse 3, the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, now of course we know that's a smart aleck response, command this stone to be made bread. Okay, there's the action. Command this stone to be made bread. A place south of uh, Jerusalem, down in that area, that there were stones, there are stones that look like loaves of bread. 
I've been down in that area. And so he said, command this stone to be made bread. Does anybody know a Bible verse that would say that's a sin? Is there anywhere in the Bible that said, thou shalt not turn stones into bread? What sin would be involved in it? I don't know of any sin. Did he not turn water to wine? So the creator can take the elements of something and change it into something else. So what would be the sin of changing bread or stones in the bread? There's no sin involved in that. So it's kind of hard to figure out, okay, what's he doing here? Let's go with the next temptation. Okay, in the next one, he, the devil take them up on a high mountain, showeth all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Then he said unto him, this power will I give thee. Does he have the power? Yeah, he just got the power. And he says, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. To whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou wilt worship me, all shall be thine. Now that one, we know the worshiping him would be sin. But the idea is, is he could have all world kingdoms. Would that be a sin for the Lord Jesus Christ to have all the world kingdoms? No, he's going to have them. Well, what's the sin involved here? We, now we know the sin would be worshiping the devil, but to get all world kingdoms, there's no sin in that. The next temptation. Okay, you drop down and uh, you'll see in verse 9, he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on a pinnacle of the temple. So at the tippy top, it said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, of course, that's a smart aleck response, cast thyself down from hence, for it is written. Oh, whoa, whoa. It is written. Who's doing the speaking? This is a satanic translation. Is this Anton LaVey's satanic Bible? Okay, is this owned by Zondervan's or, uh, you know, Harper Collins? who owns Zondervan's, that owns the rights to the NIV, who also owns the rights to the Satanic Bible. The owner of both Bibles are published in Satanic Bibles, the NIVs. Plus, they own the Thomas Nelson publisher, so they own the rights to the New King Jimmy, and they own the rights to the Satanic Bible. A little bit of a conflict of interest here. Okay, but... Okay, now what if you compare Psalm 91, verse 10 and 11, okay, or I'm sorry, 11 and 12, you'll see the technique. He'll, re, he'll go back to the original technique of adding a word, subtracting a word, or changing a word. There's nothing original with the devil's crowd. Same thing over and over. Okay, so he says this. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. Okay, the next four words are in all thy ways. So that's removed. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. He jumbles up some of the words there. So if you compare those back and forth, he goes back to technique number one, add, subtract, or change a word of words. But what would be the sin in verse 9 if Jesus Christ stepped off of the pinnacle and defied density, where density, if you're heavier than air, it goes down. Lighter than air goes up. That's what helium is. That's what smoke is. It's lighter than air. A natural law, it goes up. Heavier than air, density, a natural law, it goes down. Jesus Christ walked on water. He could have stepped out and just, okay, what trick do you want me to do next? There's no sin in that. Of course, the sin would be worshiping him, but there's no sin. What is going on here? Okay, now the, the first and the third one in this context are hard to figure out, but we can pin it down on that second one. The second one, the devil was focusing, focusing on the second coming. And in the second coming, the Lord himself can create and change the elements of things from stone to bread... He can defy the laws of nature because he's the creator. What the devil was doing, he was taking a truth of another age, pulling it into this age. That's what he was doing. That J.W., when he goes and knocks on doors and talks about the gospel of the kingdom, he's not wrong about that gospel. That's why they got to work for it. Where he's wrong is that he's taken a truth of another age and pulled it into this age. That's what that was. 
dog does in Acts 2. He is wrong. That's written to a Jew. He's failing to rightly divide the Word of God. Amen. Now, anybody that works on engines knows that if your engine is out of time, it's going to run rough. If it jumps time, the only way it's running is somebody's pushing it. <laughs> so if you take a doctrine of a second coming, pull it back to the first, you've jumped time. Yeah. Everything is beautiful in his time. It is the slickest thing. And you watch these churches, they follow satanic interpretations. They follow an interpretation where you say, witness to somebody, well, okay, you know, uh, have you ever sinned? Oh, I've never committed murder. Well, I, you know, that's Old Testament idea. Sinners was extremely wicked people. So what they're doing is they're taking a truth of another age and pulling it into this age. What the devil doing, he was trying to get the Lord Jesus Christ to go into the second coming without fulfilling the first. Isn't that yeah, amen. more subtle than a beast of the field? Right. Okay, now, if that is a legitimate way of looking at that, let's see if we have some evidence. You keep reading down, the Lord Jesus Christ is preaching in Nazareth, his hometown. He goes to the local synagogue. And somebody has the book of Isaiah the prophet in verse 17. They gave it to him. It says, he opened the book and found the place where it was written. Okay, so what did he find? In our Bible, that's Isaiah 61, verse 1, and verse 2. If you want to follow along in Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2, and let's see how the, what the Lord Jesus Christ did with this reference. I'm saying that the, the temptation problem in Luke 4 or the line of defense that we have is rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. And Jesus Christ is the originator of it. Amen. It went to Danbury Baptist in the 1800s. The Lord Jesus Christ originated this idea. In Luke chapter 4, okay, I'm going to read verse 18 in, in Luke. You follow along in, in uh, 61 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Okay, now in the Old Testament, I think it says glad tidings. So that defines our term gospel in English. Amen. And he says, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering a sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Stop. Period. It doesn't stop in verse 2, does it? I think there's a comma and a conjunction. And read the next part. Is that not the second coming? And then he says, Jesus says in verse 21, This day is this scripture fulfilled. If he would have read the rest of verse 2, he could not have said that. The Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated that at a comma or a conjunction, you could jump 1,000 or 2,000 years. The Lord Jesus Christ separated the first coming from the second coming. And when somebody takes a doctrine of another age and they try to bring it into the church time period, they take Hebrews. Chapter 3, verse 6 and 14, tribulation doctrine. And that Pentecostal will hold his people in bondage. And they're, they're not a Jew in the bunch. Right. It says Hebrews. Right. Amen. Right. I mean, it's amazing. That Catholic, uh, there's, a, there's a young farm kid in our area. He was studying to be a Catholic priest. Somehow he got one of my cassette tapes. He was very uh, un uh, offended. <laughs> So we had correspondence back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. He kept going to James 2. Faith without works is dead. I said, come on, you're a Roman Catholic. Roman. I'll, I'll give you a Christian. Roman Christian. Have you read the book of Romans? It's written to you and for you. James chapter 2. That's written to the 12 tribes which are scattered. I mean, he would hang his hat on that and would never get off of that. What, what, what's happening? The devil is taking a truth yes, sir. to another party of another age, pulling back and deceiving this young man. Yeah, 
Why? Because he wanted to defend that Holy Mother Church until the day he died. And he's still hanging his hat on that. It's an amazing thing. So this idea, the Lord Jesus Christ said right there in verse 21, this day is this scripture fulfilled. If he would have continued reading in uh, Isaiah 61, 2, he could not have said that. So the Lord Jesus Christ is demonstrating to us how to rightly divide scripture. That's our second line of defense. So if you're sitting down chatting with somebody and then they're running you to Luke, Acts chapter 2 and says, looky here, you got to repent and be baptized, every one of you, for it, you know. Uh, um, well, first off, look at the question, what shall we do? Not what shall we do? Uh, you know, somebody up in Lowell area, he, he got involved, he got this debate going with a water dog, and they wanted a professional debate. And so I threw my name in a hat, and I got picked. Oh, it's so much fun. Four nights in a row, two hours. And when I hit that thing on what must I do to be saved, then the guy gets up, the, you know, Mac, the water dog guy. He said, well, what we need to do is we need to find all those places where it says what must I do to be saved and collate all those and then get the answer, and we come up with the answer. Well, he was taking what shall we do in Acts 2, what shall we do in Luke 3. And I got up and said, wow, it's pretty hard to collate all those passages. What must I do to be saved? Because there's only one. And so if we just look at the one, we get the answer. And eh, nothing to do with baptism. Yeah, <laughs> he was taking all those other places, like John the Baptist, where the people said, what shall we do? Where the soldiers or the police officers said, well, what shall we do? And then in Acts 2, after Peter said, And then in Acts 8, you got these Samaritans and Peter's you know, thinking, hey, man, hey, oh, now what do we got going on here? I got to lay hands on, man, I don't want to be traveling all over the place to do this. And then Acts 10, Cornelius got the Holy Ghost by faith. Now, that's a Gentile. I'm a Gentile. Okay, but when I got saved, I'm not a Gentile anymore. I'm in Christ. It's a whole new creature. So this second line of defense is very simple. Rightly divide the word of truth. Amen. Now we can do that. One, start off with the first and second coming. If you would look in uh, Genesis chapter 3. Okay, this is normally uh, the first direct prophecy of the Lord Jesus. Most any prophecy teacher will do that. Fine, no problem with me on that one. But then he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Okay? It's, I always find it interesting. All the prophecy teachers will tell you her seed will be the Lord Jesus Christ, but they never tell you about his seed. Right. Judas Iscariot. Jesus said he was a devil. Can you imagine a walking, talking devil? He was so smooth for three and a half years, the apostles did not know that that was a devil manifesting himself to be a man. They didn't know that. That's how subtle. You live with somebody. You know them. Right. They lived with that devil for three and a half years and didn't know he was a devil manifesting himself to be a man. Right. Jesus said he was a devil. That's the seed of Satan. But if you look at this, it says, It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And when you run through that, the verse is going to skip 2,000 years between the first and second coming. And the Bible does that. It's an amazing thing. Now, that's why Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All the new Bibles take study out, and a vast majority take divide out. So how do we rightly divide the Bible? Well, we see right off the bat, Anybody who picks up a Bible sees about two-thirds into it, there'll be a page in there that says New Testament. So, is that not a hint? Right. A testament is similar to a covenant. Unique difference is a covenant 
is two or more parties that have an agreement where testament implies family, last will and testament, and the New Testament began at the death of the testator, the Lord Jesus. Now, I, after I, my, I was the first in our house to get saved. My parents were very religious, Dutchies, Dutch Reformed. Okay, and so I was the first one to discover that I was predestinated not to be a Calvinist, so I got saved. <laughs> and then uh, my parents got saved and my siblings got saved, and at that time we left the Dutch Corner Church. There were about five families, mostly our cousins. We started what was called a Bible church. Okay, back in those days. The, the new Bibles had not gotten in yet, so they were King James. I know they were just users, but at least they were King James. And they were dispensational according to Larkin and Schofield. Okay, now that's a great starter. Now, I know there's a minor flaw, but that doesn't mean I'm going to throw everything out. Amen. The minor flaw to me is the time periods. You correct that by the covenants. And so you run those seven covenants. You've got the Garden of Eden. You've got Adam. You've got Noah, you've got Abraham, then you got Moses, well, that was a covenant with a nation. Then you got David and a new covenant. Now, personally, I'm not concerned about the covenants because I'm in the family. Amen. I'm in the testament. Amen. I got the last will and Amen. testament. Amen. You see, and so when you understand those covenants, and then this Bible is just an amazing book. Amen. You start piecing up here, oh, Amen. and this goes here, and this Amen. goes here. Oh, man, what a book. Amen. And you see, and then you can just relax. You know, the very first commentary I read from Dr. Ruckman was Hebrews. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend reading Hebrews the first time. <laughs> but I had been dealing with so many of those Pentecostals out in Colorado, you know, Hebrews 3 and Hebrews 6, and I don't got an answer. And I know they were wrong. A lot of times you don't know what's right, but you know what's wrong. Right. And when I'd go home, the Spirit of God would say, they got you, didn't they? They got you, didn't they? Yeah, they did. I know they're wrong, and he was, yeah, they're wrong, but what's the answer? I don't know. Would you help me out? Yeah, usually within seven days, he'd give me something. Amen. And thank God for that. So the last will and test, those covenants will, I've seen these guys where they, they'll jump on the school field, and they say this about that, you know, those testaments. Are you going to throw the baby out with the bathwater? All you got to do is make a minor adjustment. Forget the time periods and go with the covenants. You see? And that's, that's the answer. So our line of defense is, is very clear. Line number one, and I'm talking to somebody, okay? When you add or subtract or change the word, I just point it out. I don't get angry and say to them, I say, I don't understand. Why, why did you throw that word in there? And then watch them squirm a little bit. Okay, and then if they take a truth out of Ezekiel, yeah, Pentecostal runs you to Ezekiel 18, and then he said, well, the soul that sinneth it shall die. And then I'll say to this guy, I said, okay, uh, how many sins are going to take you to lose your salvation? One. Oh, so does that mean you're sinless right now? Man, if it only takes one to lose it, I would have done lost in the first five minutes. And then I said to him, I said, well, could I name a few sins? He said, well, sure. And so I named some that I knew he would agree with. And he was kind of on the heavy side. So then I said, overeating and undereating. And I said, drunkard and a glutton should come to poverty. And he started backpedaling like this. I said, brother, sin, sin. You know what he believed? He believed he was sinless. You have to believe that. You got to. What they're doing is they're taking Ezekiel 18, Old Testament doctrine. They're taking Hebrews 3, Hebrews 6, tribulation doctrine. They are truthful doctrines, but when you pull up back to this age, it becomes satanic doctrines. That's the technique Satan used on the Lord Jesus. Amen. Isn't that slick? Boy, that is slick. Yeah, amen. And that's how we can overcome that. Rightly dividing the word of truth according to the seven doctrinal covenants is that second line of defense. And that involves our discernment between doctrines and instructions. Now, I can teach this whole Bible on instructions. Great instructions. But doctrines, a person be very careful. Amen. Doctrines are uniquely different. Doctrines often are limited either to a person or a group of people or to like the church. 
Okay, doctrine is totally different. And that's why he says, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. So you can teach all the Bible, instructionally, devotionally, spiritually, practically. That's looking at the Bible from our perspective. You're looking up at the Bible. When you look at the Bible doctrine, you're looking at it from a heavenly perspective because the most important doctrine in this book is the second coming. Amen. You see? And the reason why the church is doing it this way is because we get the benefit out of that. Amen. How about giving God some of the benefits? Amen. And look at the doctrines. So there's the line of defense we have. First and second, Old Testament, Adam, New Testament, the last Adam. First Adam, don't add, don't subtract, don't change a word of word from the word of God. And the second Adam, rightly divide the word of truth. And that will set that thing up where, okay, anybody set in front of me. I'm ready. I can learn. Thank you for that. Praise the Lord. Okay, we'll pray. Lord.